So what I'd like to do is, is briefly talk about uh, ARC's view, and, and many of these are, are my own uh, opinions, if you will, about the future networks uh, for the Internet of Things, and especially the Industrial Internet of Things. I have too many topics here. I promise I'll be very brief. Most of these I'm just going to touch on. I want to talk a little bit about what the requirements are for the Industrial Internet of Things networks and how, in, in my opinion, the ISA 95 model, which is, is kind of a poor match for that. And, uh, and uh, related matter is the fact that embedded systems are changing very rapidly. And kind of a question that we have in ARC in our research is where is the sweet spot? Everyone asks us this. Where is the sweet spot going to be for the industrial internet of things? And possibly, and, and, and again, an opinion here is it might, might work out to be in the automotive space and this might have some impact on us. Finally, I'm going to talk about decentralized network services. And these are, this is really important, again, my humble opinion, important new technology that's very, very um, nascent, very new, and we'll look at how that might impact industrial automation. So let's get going. I said I'd be brief. So let's start with what the requirements are for the Industrial Internet of Things in terms of the network services. First of all, I'd say that they're ad hoc services many times. These are the kind of interruptions that you were talking about, Dominique, in terms of having a situation that comes up and you have to respond to it. So these are event-driven rather than scheduled. Um, again, also, they, are multi, they need multi-mode connectivity in that while you're not moving a cement plant around, there are many assets in manufacturing that do move around, and you need to be able to connect those assets at all times. So they need to be able to use any available internet service. Third is kind of a convergence, and I'm thinking the networks need to be converged um, for the Internet of Things, and certainly many suppliers have talked about network convergence, but at least we have to converge to an end-to-end -end IP network at some degree to get that form of convergence. Because you can't manage, you know, as, as people talk about 50 million or 50 billion connected devices, you can't manage 50 billion gateways. You can only manage uh, millions of IP connections. So what about the ISA 95 model? And the ISA 95, in its defense, is not a network model. But if you go into process manufacturing plants, you'll always hear people talk about this is a level three, this is level two, this is a level one, this is a level four. And they're really talking about manufacturing operations and what operations are being performed by a certain network. And the, the difficulty is that this is a poor match in that the kind of communication that goes on in an automation system is largely periodic, very regulated, um, very real-time with a uh, well-defined uh, latency and performance metric, not ad hoc. So it's very different. And also the concept of layering, which is very, very powerful in that it tells us, it lets us to isolate or work on a simple problem is not necessarily conducive to the ad hoc kind of query about what's going on in a particular device, maybe at the edge of the network or a particular server or something like that. So it doesn't really help us with the ad hoc communications because the communications between layers have to be very much predefined. So given that that's kind of a poor match and that's the way that we have engineered and designed and thought about our automation systems for many, many years, let's switch gears and think about what's going on in terms of just the pure semiconductor technology. And that is kind of driven in many cases by these things because they're so high volume. Um, the typical or the new fangled smartphone basically has the kind of processing capability that would have been found only a few years ago in a server. And yet the volume of these, the production volume of these is hundreds of millions per year. So there's, a, there's an anecdote that kind of goes out that people will say, you know, there's more compute power 
in the pockets of people at this point in time than there is in all the data centers in the world. That's possibly true. I'm not sure that it's actually true. But the point is that very inexpensive semiconductor technologies now are multi-core. They're including, which means they have multiple processing uh, capabilities, multiple processors embedded. They have embedded virtualization. Um, and they have and run what are so-called rich operating systems, meaning uh, meaning generally Linux, so that there's a full capability in the device. You could put just about any kind of service into it. So my takeaway from this is in terms of the suppliers of devices. Uh, many times suppliers of devices, especially for long life cycle devices, think about bill of material costs. And they're very focused on bill of material costs. What this says to me is that in terms of compute power, really, uh, my advice to device suppliers would be to really think about life cycle more than bill of material costs because these kind of costs are going to drop over time for your capability. And they will, uh, over the life cycle of a, device, of a product, it would make a lot of sense to embed a great deal or as much compute power as is possible as well as network capability. Next topic, where is the IoT sweet spot? And, and we have a lot of discussion about this in ARC. Um, this little chart um, I made just, just of the, the two axes, the vertical axes, the Y axis is the r installed cost of a particular type of asset, and that's a logarithmic scale. And the, the X axis is the life cycle or the length expected life of the asset in years. Mm, let's see if I can do that, there we go. So I just plotted a few kinds of assets on this chart and what I find kind of interesting is that you find devices up here like large steam turbine generators. These things are 100, 150 million dollar devices. They're certainly going to get uh, some kind of service. You go to very low dev cost devices like a mobile handset or residential gateway for your, for your home set-top box or for your home uh, Wi-Fi service or an internet service. Very, very inexpensive devices by comparison. High volume devices, but very difficult to manage. In fact, uh, for some of the discussions I've had with uh, some of the operators of these systems is that these are almost unmanageable in terms of the types of um, uh, malware and uh, uh, security uh, problems that they create over time. So maintaining these devices, even though they have a short life cycle, is very, very difficult. And kind of in the middle are things um, that we're used, more used to in our, in our normal life, um, some, of our, some products and some normal consumer devices, and uh, electric meters, which is a whole other story. Um, uh, my experience with utilities, while they're very, very happy with having the data from these smart meters, maintaining them over a life cycle is very, very difficult, especially maintaining the software because they have such a long service life and they're very, very inexpensive and in many cases kind of minimal devices. So my hypothesis is that the sweet spot is likely to be around here. And certainly there are other ways to present this data. This is not the only way to present the data. We could talk about the volume and the dollar volume or the unit volume of these. But looking at this point on the chart, I would say, uh, hypothesize again, that the vision that's been articulated of a, of a connected car is very, very similar to many of the things that we see in manufacturing plants in terms of its uh, automation and systems. And it's getting much more like that as we go along. First of all, there are many applications. There are safety applications, automatic braking and so forth. There are control applications, and vehicle control is very important, especially if you're riding in it. There are optimization applications in terms of combustion and emissions. And there are pure convenience applications in terms of gee, I want to stream my Pandora, or I want to hear my Grateful Dead, or whatever I want to hear on the car, or I want to see the map, whatever. So there's a wide variety of applications. There is a move toward convergence in networks. In general, these are being moved towards Ethernet um, from historically device networks. The other aspect of it is that there is a high volume global 
extremely competitive industry behind this. And the industry sees technical innovation in terms of visions of the driverless car or the self-parking car or these, these consumer conveniences as being a real product differentiator. Um, I think it was Andy that mentioned yesterday in terms of what automotive manufacturers see as the software content of their product accelerating from a relatively small percentage now to a much larger percentage of their, of their value in a few years. This is kind of uh, in line with that, that projection. And because the industry is so competitive, because there are various segments from you can buy the $20,000 car, you can buy the $200,000 car. Um, I'll take the $200,000 car if somebody here can pay for it. But there is a market for these luxury segments, so technology can penetrate from the luxury segments or the high value segments into the more normal segments. So that's an opinion, but I think the important point is that the network technologies um, and especially the, the new Ethernet technologies, we wrote a report about that uh, a couple months ago, that uh, are bringing this kind of uh, convergence into automotive platforms, and I think a lot of uh, industrial automation applications will benefit from this if it happens in the long run. Okay, now let's really shift gears. I want to, th this is, uh, next to last topic is really about decentralized industrial uh, Internet of Things network services. Um, the Internet of Things vision is of billions of devices connected to each other. Is that, is that coming out, Alex? Okay. Well, I can, I can talk through a crash, so I'll talk through a crash. Um, the IoT vision is billions of devices interacting, as I said, a little bit ad hoc. Um, and yet, we have connected devices all over now, and the kinds of connections that we have in our IT organization are many times plagued with malware or, or security difficulties. And certainly, if you talk to people, and again, this is something we've heard over and over again, is that security is a number one concern. So how the heck, to use the polite term, are we going to expand connectivity by 10 or 100 or 1,000 or 10,000 times and manage this issue? The answer is we really don't know. Let me back up a little bit. OK. Huh, that's interesting. It doesn't like that at all, huh? That's the wrong presentation. Yeah. Um, the, um, so how are we going to expand? That's the question. How are we going to expand that connectivity? The answer is, we don't know. Um, but one answer that's kind of coming out as a possibility for a technology that will bring us much more secure network technology, is that that's a slide now? It looks like it. Let's see, is this crazy stuff? And now you, I, I, if you think you're seeing an ARC analyst go totally over the edge, perhaps you are. But there's, there may be method in the madness here. It isn't Bitcoin. The point is that there's technology embedded in Bitcoin, the Bitcoin system, that I think will be broadly applicable in many areas. So let me go into that before you think I'm totally off the wall crazy and just kind of explain. The critical properties of Bitcoin that are important are a couple. First of all, Bitcoin as a currency exists only in a transparent public ledger, which is called the blockchain. The ledger is not centralized. There's no central authority that maintains the ledger. The ledger is maintained by independent but paid providers. And that, the, the slang term for them is miners. Now, why the heck, let, let's just go into that a, a little bit more. And this chart is not mine. I got this from Deloitte. But the point is, it is distributed. This ledger, if you will, and you can read through this at your leisure. But the point is, the transactions are bundled into blocks. And the blocks are validated by a group of independent 
sources. Those sources are in a race, kind of in an arms race with each other to do the validation. But when they do the validation, they are rewarded. And then that provides validation of the, um, of the validity of a transaction. And the block, if you will, grows over time so that it includes all the transactions that have occurred since uh, the system began. Now, a couple of points here. First of all, this system has worked successfully on the internet for several years, but since about 2008 or 2009. It is composed of 100% open source. No one exactly knows who, dis who deposited or created the open source, so there's still somewhat of a mystery. The creator is anonymous. It may be aliens, I'm not sure, but um, it, was, it is open source. So why is this important? It represents a distributed service with no single authority managing the process. And this is something entirely different from what we have had in really our internet lifetimes. We've always had a single source that's responsible. If you need an upgrade from Microsoft, you need validation of a patch from Microsoft, you better get it from Microsoft. If somebody's imitating Microsoft and giving you malware, you're going to be in a world of hurt. Um, so we've relied on trusted counterparties for our uh, services. And this is really a different model. And so what happens here is we have something, a concept called distributed authenticity, which is a new way of thinking about what about how we can have trust on the internet among parties that generally don't trust each other. So this is, excuse me for saying this, a big paradigm shift. Um, you should throw fruit at anybody who says that, if, who is an analyst, but I will say it this time, just only this one time. It is a big shift because it's an alternative to the kind of architectures that we've seen uh, through really the whole history of IT from the client server days of the 1980s. So what this technology enables is decentralized systems and processes without a single authority to serve as an attack surface. Because if I create an important system and create a single authority to manage it, I've created an attack vector. And we know that very well. So the blockchain technology is really what protects the Bitcoin cryptocurrency from counterfeiting. But in terms of our applications, it has many, many potential future uses. And I'm just going to touch on a few. One is a, an unforgeable personal identity. Um, and so it po would be possible, it is possible to create an identity unlike your passport or your driver's license, which can be forged, that is much more difficult, virtually impossible to forge. Another point is that we see huge amounts of venture capital being poured into this area. Um, the their ventures are trying to take this specific blockchain technology from a cryptocurrency into a general purpose tool that can be used in other kinds of applications and where we can use the value of this distributed trust among uh, untrusted parties. And one of the parties that's doing this is a company with a three-letter name called IBM. And they, in the fall, uh, released a proof of concept with a stack like this with some uh, open source components that they had kind of ripped off and or so, so some people would say, and developed an architecture for devices and servers that would be much more general purpose than supporting merely a, a cryptocurrency. What, one of the things, and this is very, very early technology, but one of the things they've already built into the architecture is that one size doesn't fit all, recognizing that um, some of these activities are very, very computationally intensive, Intensive. Some of them will work very well on servers. Some of them will work very well on smaller form devices. But again, this is very, very early, early work. So what are the, what are the, con the implications for industrial automation and industry in general? First of all, this stuff is now very much at a proof of concept stage. So it's extremely early, but it's very important, in my humble opinion, because it has kind of changed the way we think about systems. 
it doesn't, one size doesn't fit all. And as we would say in, in, in a market report, factors favoring. The factors favoring adoption are intense venture capital and software investment focus. There are many, many smart people working to figure out now what the applications of this new technology would be. And the kind of benefits that we might anticipate, although again, this is very speculative, are systems with much higher levels of security that would afford privacy so that manufacturers, suppliers, markets could communicate more effectively without necessarily compromising or trusting each other. That we could have secure, much more greater security in terms of our device management and updates. And we could have secure interactions or contracts between untrusted counterparties. So this, this kind of brings internet commerce to a new level, or it could do that, but we're really not sure. So I would say these aut autonomous decentralized networks and peer-to-peer -peer interactions are certainly a space that we will be watching at ARC. Um, it's, you will probably be hearing about it in the next few years ad nauseum. Um, and certainly there's tons of money going into it. Now this is the last minute of my allocated time slot, so I just want to summarize what we talked about here. Um, the inter industrial Internet of Things requires services, network services, that are quite a bit different from automation networks. And the second point is that computation is dirt cheap from the CPU level, from the processor level, and getting cheaper all the time which has implications for automation systems over time. Third is the personal opinion that automotive applications and architectures may be a, a big driver for the industrial Internet of Things technologies. Not that cars are the be all and end all of what we're trying to manage, but that the types of systems that go into those, the types of solutions that are developed for those may have broad implications for our industrial automation world. And finally, that this blockchain technology enables a new class of decentralized network services that is quite a bit different from what we have traditionally had since the development of the client-server era and the internet in the 1980s and 90s. So many decentralized services, will, or decentralized services may find applications in very many different areas. So with that, I will close. Thank you very much. And now we will switch to our um, panel, thank you.